That's my friend Lauren. Hi. On the fence about what? Oh. Oh, about my. <laughs> Something's recording. Oh, the Facebook is on, right? Let's turn the volume off over here. Is this right? Whoa, how'd you do it? What'd you do? I just clicked stream. You did a good job. I think you did it right. I think we did it. Okay, now let's go to your you, my YouTube. Oh my gosh, Keith, you fixed it. Okay. Sorry, everyone. If I'm yelling in, in anyone's ear. Um. Oh, how'd you do it? Ah, sorry. <laughs> okay, we have to close the Facebook over here. Okay. Oh, that's... <laughs> Everything's okay. Sorry, everyone. Okay, Doctor Wayne's world. Do we have to connect this back? Yeah, no, plug that back in, and then I'll go here. Keith fixed it. There was a problem, and Keith fixed it. Um, use phone for audio. Yes. Um, uh, Wayne. Uh -huh. Do you want these things up top, or is is it? Should we get rid of that? It should get rid of it once. I don't know how it's doing. Sorry, guys. I'm just trying to um, learn how to function in this brand new world of Uber technology. Okay. Now I come here and I also have to present for you guys. Open. Oh, <clears throat> I'm just going to do this barefoot because I am not going to. Oh, you should connect that too. Yes. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. I'm going to have, no, no, no. I'm going to have, I'm going to share screens. I'm going to have uh, my slides up for you guys in presentation. Don't worry. Oh, and you need to be able to see. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, and I'm just connecting. Okay, I'm pathologically ten minutes late, so. Can you hear it? Is it okay now? Okay, yeah, it's, I had to connect my headphones to the thing. Okay. Yeah. Okie dokie. Yep. Yep. I don't have any notifications in here that he uh, needs to be let in, but, oh, wait, I just had... Merkler just joined. Hi, Dr. Merkler. Let me then wait. Oh, he's there. And then who else we got? So we've got everyone except for Dr. Vandervaart. Uh, yeah. So let me go see if I can get him in. At the end of the YouTube, looks like it's kind of wonky. It might be just a lag. No, it's not. Okay, I'll have to do something with that. Okay. Uh... Okay, I'm telling him to try again to see if I need to. 
Dr. Merkler left the meeting. I bored him already. wants to join let him in it still looks like that yeah okay so I have this <clears throat> da -da 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 -da. numbers 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 I'm just putting a timer on the thingy uh, okay Dr. Merkler's back. I sent Dr. Vandervaart a message to try again. I'm just, I'm gonna uh, share the screens once I know that Dr. Vandervaart's in. That's all I'm waiting for. Someone wants to join QQ. Uh, I don't know if I should let this person in. I don't know who this is. Outside of university joined? Why do I feel nervous about that? Okay. Uh, remove. Why is it only streaming? It's on here, try it. What? Over here in OBS. No, I'll get this picture. I'm just still, it's again QQ. I don't know if it's Dr. Vandervert or not. I'm trying to. If he's QQ. Why is it just streaming that little corner? Is he QQ again? I again have a QQ. Just zoom, just do, this red box just needs to be zoomed down. Okay. Nope, nope. Is that wrong? Okay. Okay. Yep. Okay, then we let him in and I kicked him out. Then that's okay. So who's QQ? Dr. Vandervert. Oh, uh, okay. I don't, I'm, you know, I'm nervous about all these Zoom bombers. And I'm like, now they're really going out of their way. Apparently, they give themselves names like QQ. So what? <laughs> Don't worry, it's okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm watching the YouTube stream. <laughs> it's just hilarious. Apparently, everyone's having a lot of fun with this, <laughs> except for me. <laughs> what the heck? Okay, now. Okay. Bring forward. I'm almost done, guys. Move to top. There we go. Okay. Yep, that's that's right. <laughs> I don't think. Okay. Okay. All right. Wait, hang on. Let me, let's make sure that that's correct. Now let's we're see. checking all the different. <clears throat> I'm oh. still seeing this. It's probably just lagged. Okay. Oh, yeah, I think it's right now. It's lagged. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Now, share. No. I have Q. Go to me.
present. Okay. Okay, committee, can you guys see a loading screen that will become my presentation soon? Okay, great. And Facebook, I'm sorry if you're behind, but we're just gonna go for it. Okay. Okay, so you're on you're you're seeing stuff, right? Uh -huh. Okay. Hi everyone. Hi committee. Hi people on the internet. Thank you all so much for being here. Sorry it took a little bit to get started. Um, this is a brave new world for all of us, I think. But you have arrived at my presentation of my dissertation thesis. So this is like all the combined work over the past five or six years. So every event that I said no to, this is why. Um, and this is the title of my thesis here, Development and Application of Computational Models for Biochemical Systems. And that kind of is pretty general. Um, and it doesn't really say anything specific, but I find it to be the fortunate result of the fact that I've had um, a lot of different experiences in computation as a grad student. And so I really, I uh, appreciate the wide breadth of knowledge that I've gathered. Um, so let's check, yeah. So since I tried to share this link pretty far and wide on the internet, um, I, I'll just give a little bit of background about myself first. So my name's Fiona, that's me right there. You can also see me on your screen, hopefully. Um, I was born in Miami, I was raised in a small town called Palm Bay, Florida, and then I came to USF, which is in Tampa, Florida, as uh, to pursue a bachelor's degree in chemistry. Um, and then while in my bachelor's degree studies, I found the computational biochemistry lab of H. Lee Woodcock, that's this guy here, and I started volunteering there as an undergrad, and then I just loved it so much I stayed with it, so, and then I decided I'll just, you know, I might as well get a PhD. Um, so now I'm presenting to you all the work I've done over actually kind of like eight years. Um, but right, <clears throat> so this is Tampa. It's a beautiful city. Watch Tiger King. Um, and this is a picture of our campus. This is the University of South Florida. It's a gorgeous campus. And this is our lab group, uh, our recent lab photo taken at Anna Maria Island, which is a little beach on the west coast of Florida right there. And we're actually celebrating uh, my wedding. So that's me and my husband, Keith who is on the couch right now. Um, so it's usually on this slide that I try to encourage people, oh, you know, you should visit Florida, come here, come to a conference here, come give a talk here. But might I instead interest you in a great American tour of your own house or your own apartment? You could go see one of your other bedrooms if you have them. Um, yeah, so let's do our part to stay inside and, and that's why we're all here viewing me through the computer instead of in person. Okay, so also because I tried to share this link far and wide on the internet, I want to give a backstory to what computational chemistry is, because I'm sure plenty of people don't really know what that means. Um, and then I'll, I'll talk briefly about how computational chemistry is being applied to combat and tackle the ongoing crisis that we have right now, which is uh, coronavirus, novel coronavirus uh, 2019 strain. Um, but I'll warn you when I'm about to talk about that in case you're just totally COVIDed out and you don't want to hear about it anymore. So I'll just talk about it for like two to three minutes. Okay, great. So I think we all have some intuitive understanding about what chemistry is, right? Chemistry is the study of matter, but that phrase is somewhat platitudinous. It doesn't really make much sense. Um, really, matter is everything. It's everything that has mass. Anything that has mass is uh, made up of all of these elements here, which are listed on the periodic table of elements. Right? And those elements or atoms from that elements come together to make molecules, the molecules that are in the water that we swim in and love and the clouds and the air. It makes up all the food that we eat and that food that we eat gives us energy to sit on the couch and watch someone else do exercise. Um, you know, matter and elements also come together to make up materials that we need for daily life, like clothes, tables, computers. And um, also hopefully we can use chemistry to combat diseases. So uh, we can design drugs and design disease treatments, and that's really what we're doing actively right now um, in attempt to combat coronavirus. So when most people think of a chemist, I think most people probably think of somebody who looks like this, right? Wearing PPE, wearing gloves, wearing, uh, you know, pouring solutions into test tubes and using some instrumentation to explore those uh, solutions. Or maybe like these two chemists here conducting some reaction and then observing the reaction in front of them on a macroscopic scale. 
Another way to explore chemistry that most people aren't aware of is through the use of computer simulations, right? So I take information from experiment about how atoms and molecules move and interact with one another, and then I construct computer models of those molecules, allow them to interact with one another, like this is a protein over here, this is a protein I'm gonna talk about later, and then I see how those atoms and molecules interact, and hopefully I can use that information and feed it back into experiment, right? Hopefully we can provide predictive information to experiment, or we can, pro um, we can provide supportive data towards experiment, right? So maybe they have results and maybe we can support them with computer models. Okay, so now, oh, sorry, I told you I would uh, give you a warning. I'm gonna do about two to three minutes about coronavirus. So if you're all COVIDed out and you can't handle it anymore, just step away from the computer, go to the bathroom, I don't know. Uh, it's your house. Um, <clears throat> so this is a computer model of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus that my friend from Twitter made. And it shows us the packet, the, the phospholipid packet, and within that is all of the RNA needed to make a new coronavirus. But the thing about viruses is they can't replicate on their own. So what they have to do is they have to infect a host cell and then hijack the host cell's replication machinery to then cause the host cell to actually replicate it and send off new replicated viruses. So this guy is right here, that's the coronavirus. And in this beautiful schematic drawn by, by another friend of mine on Twitter, um, Clara, you, she shows how the virus gains entry to a host cell. So this stuff down here is a human cell. And it gains entry by binding to a receptor on the outside of the host cell, right? And it binds to that receptor through this protein on the outside of the coronavirus itself, right? So if we go back to Brady's model, hopefully it doesn't override it, but in Brady's model, that's this orange thing right here. That's called the spike protein. Another fun name that we're giving it is called the demogorgon protein, but the spike protein binds to this human host cell receptor. The human cell pulls the virus in, opens it and releases RNA. Then the human host's uh, machinery replicates the RNA and transcribes all of the needed proteins, and then our own Golgi complex packages up the virus and sends it off, right? <clears throat> What's wrong, Keith? The pointer's not showing up in the Google Meet. Yeah, yeah, I know. Okay. They know, yeah. Okay, great. The pointer's not showing up in Google Meet. It should show up over here. It's showing up for the people on the internet because I only have one spotlight pointer. But for, the, for my committee, I'll switch to, to the pointer when I do the private defense. Okay, fabulous. Moving on. Um, right, so going back to this, we see that a key interaction for coronavirus infection is it needs to get into the host cell. That's a spot where we as scientists could look for drug treatments, right? And that is an area, there's a lot of research in uh, coronavirus happening as we go. We're finding out plenty new information minute by minute. Um, but one thing that's key is we're learning how to simulate this spike protein, hopefully those videos come up at some point, uh, this spike protein in real time, and then we can understand, okay, if we know how the protein moves, then we can figure out what motions are fundamental to that movement, and then possibly inhibit it. So two groups right now are um, Romeo and Morrow's group, my future group, the best. so I've had a lot of publications, and as I've mentioned, that I can is pretty in diverse realms of different types of publications, and I can summarize all of that work into two overarching themes. So the first being in there, I'll just stand in front of this. The first being in computer aided molecular design. So uh, you know I've done a lot of homology modeling, flexible docking studies, MD simulations, PKA calculations, QMMM, all that, even down to like ADME property predictions. And then on the other half, I've done a lot of method development. So particularly in free energy simulation method development and improving overlap between levels of theory um, and uh, indirect free energy simulations. Now, if I tried to talk about all of this today, of course, you would probably get annoyed and, and question my judgment. So I'm gonna focus on these three uh, topics. And that's in um, <clears throat> first being flexible docking, it, for, of P450s, uh, homology modeling, 
uh, yeah, and, and flexible blocking of people 50s. Then in PETES, plastic degradation, and then in uh, PKA prediction through indirect free energy simulations. <clears throat> I'm just gonna keep on going, and then, okay. So, <clears throat> yeah, good. Good job, Keith. Oh wait, no, too too far, too far. Stop, stop, stop. Keith. Okay, go sit down, Keith. <laughs> Sorry, you're helping. Okay, public people, if you're still out there, we're here. Okay, great. So. The first thing I want to talk about is in um, a collaborative effort that we collaborated with a natural products chemistry group at USF in understanding the structure and function of this small molecule here called Arabusanone. <clears throat> and this was discovered in Antarctica in 2001 by a natural products group at USF. And <clears throat> so just to start off, I'm going to describe what natural products is. Um, natural products is a subdiscipline in chemistry with, which seeks to characterize all the unique types of chemistry out there. <clears throat> and uh, for example, I have some, some illustrations here. So these two, <clears throat> these two are uh, taking a kayak out into the bay to collect some epiphytes and bring them back into the lab. And these epiphytes and other biological species, they bring back to the lab, and then they see if they can extract any chemicals from them or any new molecules from them with new structures that we've never seen before, right? So these two are out gonna go collect some biological species from the mangroves. Now, in this picture over here, we see Dr. Baker, so that's this guy, and his student Andrew, and they do something that's super, super cool. So they go scuba diving in Antarctica and they collect um, species off of the seafloor and bring those back to the lab to see if they can isolate any new species from that. So this is super cool stuff. Um, right, so in 2001, as I mentioned, this small molecule, Arabusanone, was discovered in Antarctica and it was discovered and isolated from a sea sponge. And you can see that sea sponge there. <coughs> Um, and one of the first things they do when they isolate a new molecule is they try to understand what purpose is that molecule serving for the species that it was isolated from, right? So this was isolated from a sea sponge. Maybe it's serving as some chemical defense mechanism for the sea sponge, and that's what they hypothesized. So this, this little creature on the right here is Orchomeni plebs. That is a uh, crustacean predator, so it's an arthropod, but it preys upon these sea sponges in Antarctica. So they hypothesize that maybe the uh, arabicinone is serving as some type of chemical defense against predation. So they fed the small molecule, arabicinone, to the, the crustacean, and they saw that, yes, it, it actually protects against predation by inhibiting molting in the crustacean. So the crustacean eats the arabicinone, it, it can't molt, and then as a result, it dies, right? So this is really interesting ecological interaction between the sea sponge and the crustacean, and they wanted some more support. Unfortunately, they couldn't characterize this mechanism any further experimentally, so they came to us to see if there was any modeling we could do. And so in order to understand the, um, the ecological interaction from a molecular standpoint, we, uh, we evaluated the biochemical pathway required to actually induce molting in crustaceans and then figured out how that's, that's regulated naturally in the crustaceans. So molting in crustaceans is caused ultimately by this pathway here. All of my pointers have now stopped working, so I'm just going to use my ancient pointer. Um, all, <clears throat> all molting in crustaceans is caused by this pathway here, right? It's ultimately caused from intake of cholesterol into the little guy. And then 2-deoxydisone is hydroxylated by two proteins to this molecule called 20 hydroxydisone These two proteins are a special type of protein called a P450 protein. Uh, the, this molecule is the molt-inducing hormone, meaning when this molecule is produced, in the crustacean, the crustacean molts. So we have little Mr. Krabs down at the bottom, right? But of course, the crustacean doesn't want to be molting all the time. So instead, it produces this other <coughs> molecule called xanthurinic acid. And xanthurinic acid binds to these two active sites of these proteins 
inhibits these proteins, inhibits the production of 20 hydroxy disone, inhibits molting. So in the crustacean, molting is a natural balance between xanthronic acid and 20 hydroxy disone. Now, if we go back to arabicinone, um, they discovered that this molecule inhibits molting. So the question became, does it do that by mimicking the natural pathway of xanthorinic acid? So we constructed homology models of these two proteins and conducted docking studies to understand that, that mechanism, right? So as I said, we constructed homology models. If, you're not, if there's anything that I, I'm saying that you're confused about, I've included a bunch of links in the YouTube description and in the Facebook page. Um, so homology modeling is a means for predicting the 3D structure of a protein when you don't know the structure. So we predicted the 3D structures of these proteins because there's no known crystal structure for these proteins. We then conducted flexible docking studies. So we placed the molecules of interest into those acrocytes of both the native substrates, so like 2 dioxide ictisone, and of uh, xanthorinic acid and arabicinone. And then we compared all the resultant posts to identify if there's any key interactions that are important for uh, inhibition, regulation, and whatnot. Okay, so <clears throat> this is what we got. And we, we did a bunch more analysis here, but I'm just going to cut straight to the point. So we first docked the, res the um, substrate and the product into both proteins to see if we could replicate chemical uh, you know, predict chemical nature of these proteins. So we dock 2 de and ictisome into CYP315A1. And this was awesome because we saw in our predicted binding modes that the heme iron was really close to that, the carbon that it's supposed to hydroxylate, which is great. So with docking studies, we were able to predict the overall chemistry of those enzymes. Um, and same with 314, but this time we, we saw that the steroidal complex flipped, which is important because it hydroxylates at a completely different point. So this was awesome. This, this uh, validated our homology models. Additionally, we then, of course, docked xanthoric acid and arabicinone. And what's key to know is that for xanthoric acid, we docked, um, <clears throat> we got a similar predicted binding free energies in both proteins, and that's supported by literature, which says that xanthoric acid likely inhibits both proteins. So that's awesome. Additionally, of course, we then docked arabicinone, and we saw not only does it have, um, not only does it bind with favorability to both proteins but it has a lower predicted binding free energy, which is a higher binding affinity. Everything in nature tends towards its lowest energy. So um, it docks with lower predicted binding free energy than xanthoric acid, which could be expected of an inhibitor, but also it appears to prefer 315 with an even lower predicted binding free energy. So we got lots of information out of this. Um, and furthermore, we saw that docking in arabicinone comes down to a key aromatic interaction in the binding site where it forms this edge-to-face um, pie, pie stacking or aromatic interaction with this particular residue, phenylalanine 98. That residue is predicted both from P450 literature and from our docking studies with the native substrate to be important for activity of the enzyme. Right, so we think that arabicinone, based on this, we think arabicinone inhibits by binding to 315 and capitalizing on a key aromatic interaction of the binding site. Um, yeah. You tell me when. Ready to go? Oh, <laughs> thanks, Dr. Greta. I'm s <laughs> then I realized, oh, duh, they all muted their microphones. <laughs> okay, sorry. Okay, okay. Um, okay, right. So now I'm going to take a, a little bit of a turn and start talking about something slightly different, still in the world of molecular design or computer aided molecular design. So this was a project I started in the middle of my graduate career, and it's really been a highlight of my graduate study thus far, and that's in characterizing and engineering of a plastic degrading aromatic polyesterase. This enzyme is called PETASE. Many of you might have heard about it. Um, this was the combined efforts of 21 different authors, so all of these people spanning five different institutions, and those institutions are on three different continents, so it was really a global interdisciplinary effort, and it's really uh, in in tackling something that's globally impactful. And I know that it seems like there's a new global crisis every week, but um, you know, 
Of course, coronavirus is important. Additionally, the plastic pollution crisis is insanely important and it's something that we need to tackle soon because it's only becoming more and more of a problem, right? So we pollute anywhere from five to 13 million metric tons of plastic into the ocean every year. And if you do the math, that comes down to about one to three garbage trucks of plastic finding their way into the ocean every minute. So that's really, really scary. And um, unfortunately, it's having a lot of negative impacts, of course, on, on our biology, on oceanography. And uh, we have these giant, great ocean garbage patches of plastic floating around. So this is not good. Um, so if we want to understand the problem better, we first need to look at what is plastic structurally, and then what happens to plastic, particularly single-use plastic, when we're done using it. Um, plastic, or uh, yeah, plastic, the number one polyester plastic manufactured is polyethylene terephthalate, and that's this structure right here. Um, and, and just for non polymer chemists, this little angular bracket with a square bracket on the end, that means that this thing inside is a repeating unit in either direction, right? So it, we could think of it like Lego, coincidentally, because Lego is also made of plastic, um, but, but if we take this piece, monomer, what's called a monomer, and stack it together, we could form a long chain, that's a polymer, that plastic polymer can then stack around each other and then you form sheets, and the sheets can wrap around to form a plastic bottle, right? So structurally, at the very simplest case, plastic looks like this. And PET, in particular, stands for polyethylene terephthalate, and if you're in your home, which you should be, um, and you reach out and look for any piece of plastic nearby, I can pretty much guarantee there's likely something with this number very close to you. That's polyethylene terephthalate. This is the big guy, this is everywhere. It's in plastic bottles, plastic packaging, textiles, carpeting for some reason, it's everywhere. So if we need to solve the plastic pollution crisis, we really need to first start by looking here. Um, so if we think about a single plastic bottle, what happens to it at the end of its life? Well, uh, unfortunately four out of five pieces of pet plastic find their way into a trash can, which means that they will ultimately either go to a landfill or make their way into the oceans. And of course, this is terrible for the environment because plastic is so durable that it can remain in the environment for up to 400 to 500 years once it gets there, right? And then in the ocean, it breaks down into microplastics, it gets in fish gills, it's now lodged in ice cores, what, what we have left of the ice cores and whatnot. Um, so this is bad. So, and everyone's pretty guilty of it. I'm sorry, I'm also guilty of it. So we need to instead try to recycle the plastic, right? So uh, one in five pieces of plastic make their way to a recycling bin, but unfortunately recycling bins ultimately find their way to what's called a mechanical recycling outlet. And mechanical recycling means that the plastic is ground, heated, and then poured into a mold, but that forms a secondary plastic with decreased material strength, therefore decreased economic value, right? It's cloudier, it's not as durable, it's flimsy, so we're not gonna be able to convince like Coca-Cola to package its, its products in a plastic bottle with decreased material strength. Um, so ideally, instead, we'd be able to chemically recycle plastic, which means we'd be able to depolymerize, take the long strains and break them off, back to our Lego analogy, we break each Lego piece off, and then resynthesize pet plastic anew from, from like the beginning. Um, unfortunately, the current methods we have to do this are too expensive. It, in, it requires high heat, high pressure, really caustic chemicals and whatnot. Um, so it's actually cheaper for a plastic production company to purchase what's called virgin pet or brand new pieces of pet plastic from the source than it is to purchase chemically recycled uh, co compounds required to synthesize pet plastic, right? So we need to change the economics here. We need to find a way for efficiently recycling, uh, chemically recycling pet plastic um, so that we can encourage that as the outcome. Okay, so uh, fortunately or unfortunately, we've actually introduced so much plastic or yeah, so much plastic into the environment that bacteria have evolved to eat it. And this is just a really shocking photo taken at a pet plastic recycling plant. Um, but that bacteria is Idionella sacchiensis. It was isolated from that pet plastic recycling plant in Japan in 2016, and it was found adhered to these pieces of pet plastic, to these pl pet plastic bottles, which is just amazing. Uh, or not good, good, I don't know. Um, but it actually eats pieces of pet plastic by depolymerizing and degrading pet 
into its starting components, that's these two, terephthalic acid and ethylene glycol. And then the bacteria itself actually uses those as its carbon source and its energy source. Now, it does that, the bacteria does that by excreting these two enzymes called pedase and metase. And pedase, this first enzyme here, is responsible for depolymerizing pet plastics. So if we think back to our Lego analogy, pedase breaks off each individual Lego. Now, metase is a super cool enzyme, then takes each Lego and cuts it in half. Right? It hydrolyzes this last remaining ester bond so that after treatment with these two enzymes, we get back terephthalic acid and ethylene glycol. And the great news is that these are what we need to chemically synthesize brand new pet plastics. So these enzymes, we can employ them to chemically recycle pet plastics. This is awesome stuff, right? And so when this bacteria was discovered in 2016 and when the enzymes were discovered, there was a big rush to understand the structure function relationships of, of petase and, and metase. Um, and our experimental collaborators were not immune to this petase gold rush. And they were some of the first to get a picture of pet plastic. They were definitely the first to get such a high resolution picture of pet plastic. So this is the picture, oh, not pet plastic, sorry, petase, the enzyme. This is petase here. And uh, this is the picture that they got at 9.92 angstrom resolution crystal structure. And what they saw, as well as many other structural biologists in the community, is that petase has an overall similar fold to cutinase, right? They both adopt the same alpha beta hydrolase fold. Also, they have high sequence homology, so the two enzymes have 52% sequence identity. And they both operate using the same catalytic machinery. So they both follow a serine hydrolase pathway. They both have a serine histidine aspartate catalytic triads. So despite all of these similarities, PETACE is highly active on pieces of pet plastic. So structures that look like this, with this repeating units of aromatic, aliphatic, aromatic, aliphatic, right? Whereas cutinase operates on structures that look like this, on substrates that are highly aliphatic, like this, right? So despite all of their similarities, they have vastly different substrates. So the question became, what are the differences in these two enzymes that would afford petase, the pet plastic degradation activity, as opposed to cutinase? So one of the first things we noticed is that petase has a much wider binding cleft. So we see in petase we have a binding cleft about nine, cutinase about three, and that's because in cutinase there's this phenylalanine amino acid, which is just a much larger group poking into that binding cleft, whereas in petase there's a serine. Additionally, in petase we have two tryptophans, and that pr provides kind of a hydrophobic or a water-fearing region around the catalytic triad. Whereas in cutinase, we have a polar residue, a histidine, where there's a tryptophan in petase. So we thought that if we would mutate those two positions to their identity in cutinase, we'd arrive at an enzyme with decreased pet degradation activity because we wanted to understand what about petase or, or gives it that um, pet degradation activity, right? So we thought we'd get an enzyme with decreased pet degradation activity. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, we arrived actually at the opposite. So we we're able to arrive at an enzyme with increased pet pl plastic degradation activity, which is super, super cool. So this is a piece of pet plastic treated with a control buffer. So this is a control. This is a piece of pet plastic treated with petase enzyme. And all of these little craters here, all of that, that's the enzyme eating away at the surface. Okay, and then C is a picture of pet plastic after treatment with the double mutant. Now maybe these two look qualitatively similar, but let's follow the graph here, picture D. Right, and we're going to follow this blue um, diagonally striped bar. So this bar indicates the concentration of PET monomer in solution after treatment with the enzyme. So if we go back to our Lego analogy, that's the number of Lego pieces released into solution. Okay, and with treatment with PETACE, we have a large number of monomers in solution, a large number of Legos. That's awesome. That's exactly what we want. After treatment with the double mutant, and again, this was something we thought would have decreased activity, we actually have increased number of PET plastic monomers in solution, increased number of Legos. So it was opposite hypothesis, but actually awesome because it shows us that the enzyme's not fully optimized. We could actually optimize this enzyme more for PET plastic degradation. Okay, now as I tried to tell you at the beginning, I am not an experimental chemist, so I didn't do that past stuff, those like um, pretty pictures and everything. But what we did from a computational perspective, I think was super, super important to this work because uh, despite our collaborators' best efforts and a lot of other structural biologists' best efforts, no one could get a really good picture of a piece of pet plastic bound 
in the PEDACE active site, right? So we couldn't see how the plastic pieces themselves were interacting with the active site and the binding cleft. So computationally, we conducted flexible docking studies to see and predict how the PET oligomer might be binding to the binding cleft. So these are those results here. So on the left, we have pet, a piece of PET plastic, and that's like four units, four repeating units of PET plastic found in the PETACE wild type enzyme. And what we see is key is these two aromatic interactions supported by these two tryptophans. So these two tryptophans point directly at aromatic rings, and those are, ser are serving to orient and bind the substrate within appropriate attack distance from the serine hydroxyl, right? <clears throat> um, and that's the, that's the catalytic residue. That's the residue that's going to do the chemistry in the active site, so it's really cool to see. But furthermore, we also docked the piece of PET plastic into the double mutant enzyme, and we see that the, the, the key mutation was this mutation from serine to phenylalanine, which increases the number of aromatic interactions in the active site, resulting in a decreased binding free energy or predicted binding free energy relative to the wild type. And uh, furthermore, it, it tightens the bind. So it brings the sessile carbon closer to the nucleophilic serine, right? So it actually makes that, that, that chemistry more likely bringing that in, in direct contact. All right, super awesome. So uh, this was great because we were able to model the enzyme, model the substrate, but also it, we provided results that somewhat supported experiment in that we saw that the double mutant seemed to have lower predicted binding free energy or increased binding affinity. Great, now, um, PET, PET is not the only type of plastic available on the market. PEF is another type of plastic and it's marketed as the bio-friendly alternative to PET. And it's biofriendly to synthesize for sure. It re requires a decreased number of produced CO2 upon synthesis, but um, it's just as durable. So it will remain in the environment just as long as PET plastic. You know, therefore we need to figure out how to get rid of it as well. And of course, PETACE can degrade it. Otherwise I wouldn't bring it up. Um, this is a piece of PEF plastic after treatment with the wild type enzyme. The C, picture C is a piece of PEF plastic after treatment with the double mutant. And on the top here, this is a docking result where I flexibly docked PEF oligomer into the PETACE wild type enzyme. And again, aromatic interactions are key for binding and orienting the substrate. And in the double mutant, increased aromatic interactions are key for binding, orienting, and having a lower predicted binding free energy. So we got quite a bit of um, news attention for this. Uh, this was really exciting to be a part of, especially to be a part of something that reinvigorated the whole reduce, reuse, recycle discussion. But my favorite part was that we actually, this story got picked up on Trevor Noah's Daily Show, um, and they did a, a spotlight about it for, um, for an Earth Day. And uh, so this guy here, that's John McGeehan, and that's the same guy there, and there's one of the PIs, along with Dr. Woodcock. And uh, yeah, so it was just really fun. Um, and then after this went on the Daily Show, I tried to contact Trevor Noah and be like, you know, if you need any, you know, continuing reporting scientist, I can come do it. I think I'm kind of funny. And um, he shockingly did not get back to me. So um, the story is not over here, because if you remember, in order to de degrade PET or depolymerize PET, we needed two enzymes, or the bacteria needed two enzymes. PETase does the depolymerization, depolymerization breaks off the Legos. Metase cuts each Lego in half. And I don't know if that's possible with Legos, but at least here it's possible. Um, so we, you know, uh, we've done, we reassembled the Avengers, we then like also modeled Medes, they did a bunch of experimental stuff. Um, so we're working on this now, I can't go into detail because we want to publish it soon, so be on the lookout for that. Um, it's very, very, very exciting. Okay, now I hope I haven't bored you too much because I'm about halfway through, but I'm going to cover one topic in the last bit here, and this is a doozy. So. I'm going to start um, with a quick analogy for free energy because this is uh, now kind of going into my method developments and free energy simulations as well as I'm going to talk about PKA prediction. So just to try to concretize a lot of the information I'm going to provide, I'm going to give you a little analogy that hopefully can stick in your head and even if you get lost you can at least think of the analogy and maybe chuckle, I don't know. You can do what you want. Okay. Oh, shit. sorry guys, I went too far. Okay. So, <clears throat> free energy is the energy available to a system to do work, right? And work is the energy transferred by a system to its surroundings. Now, when I first learned these definitions, that was very difficult for me to grasp. The canonical thermodynamic example of this is if you have a gas in a container and that container is connected to a piston, 
If you heat the gas, which is providing energy transfer by temperature difference, you can imagine that the gas would expand and push the piston up, right? Well, that is a gas doing pressure volume work, right? It's applying for, it's moving the piston, which is force over a distance. It's applying a force over a distance, so that's definitely work, right? So that's the classic thermodynamic exa example. And then you can imagine you, human, coming and pushing the piston back down. That's the surroundings doing work on the system. That, you could actually drive that and actually, then that's how refrigerators kind of work, I guess. Okay, uh, that, when I learned that, that canonical example, I that this doesn't really stick in my head. I don't work with engines or refrigerators, um, but I did grow up playing soccer, and I tried to connect a lot of things that I know or learn to things that I have experience with in real life. So we're going to consider, in our case, a system being a person playing soccer, right? And then we're going to consider two states of that same system. Okay, so the first state we're going to consider is Megan Rapino playing soccer. So if you don't know who Megan Rapinoe is, I included some uh, like clip shows of her. She's an awesome soccer player. She's famous for making like these amazing cross the, the top crosses into players, connecting. She has a lot of energy. She runs really fast, a lot of really cool footwork on the field. So she's an amazing soccer player. That's all I'm trying to say. So we can imagine that she occupies a maxima on our free energy landscape, on our analogous free energy landscape, where the landscape is calculated as the amount of work that someone could do in a 90 minute soccer game, okay? So she can do a lot of work in a 90 minute soccer game. Okay, so that's state one. And we're gonna consider another state, back to our analogy, state two, which is going to be me playing soccer. And now a lot of you have not had the pleasure of listening to me complain for the past few weeks um but for example some of my complaints have been that my back hurts because i sit too long at the computer i have carpal tunnel syndrome so i'm a little out of shape so it's safe to say that i maybe occupy a free energy well right i can't do a lot of work during 90 minutes on a soccer game so we occupy two different regions of this free energy landscape, which is amount of work that can be done during a soccer game, right? How much work Neymar can do, I don't know. Um, so in chemistry, we're often not really interested in an absolute free energy. We're more interested in free energy differences between two states, right? What's the free energy difference between Megan and I? And we could consider this two ways. We could say, what's the free energy difference between Megan, starting from Megan and going to Fiona? In order to calculate that, we would just calculate the free energy of me, a low number, and subtract the free energy of Megan, a high number, we get a negative value, that's a spontaneous process. So if Megan's not careful, if she decides to pick up a PhD, or if she, uh, if we have one or two more quarantines, she could naturally fall down this free energy hill and end up in the well that I'm in, right? Alternatively, if I wanted to become a United States women's national player, I would have to do a lot of stuff. I would have to get a trainer, eat right, stop eating cookies, exercise all the time, probably stop research. So there were a lot of other things would have to allow me to, to become a United States Women National Team player, right? So this is not spontaneous, okay? Um, and then finally, free energy is a state function. It's not dependent on path. So there are many ways that Megan could fall down into my well here, right? She could fall over this other hill, go around that hill, come out on the other side, right? But the free energy difference between Megan's state and my state are always going to be the same, okay? It's path independent, and that's going to become important later. Now, in chemistry, we're not very interested in soccer players, unfortunately, that much, but we are interested in free energy differences between molecules often. And, and one particularly interesting free energy difference is free energy difference between ATP and ADP, this is adenosine triphosphate, and this is what's called the energy currency of the cell. Um, this guy is high in free energy, and when it's hydrolyzed, releasing a phosphate to produce ADP that's low in free energy, we have a release of free energy, or it's a spontaneous process. And so if you think of the mitochondria as the powerhouse of the cell, then ATP is the energetic money by which all of the non-favorable biological processes in the cell are funded. Right, so this is a really important free energy difference. Um, and so free energy differences like this are something that we often like to model and study. Okay, great. So hopefully I've at least convinced you that free energy is important, if not at least amusing. Um, and free energy, there are many different types of free energy interests, 
in chemistry, so salvation free energies, finding free energies, free energies along some rotation, a reaction, relative properties like free energy difference between me and Megan. Um, but today I'm going to focus on free energy differences between protonated and deprotonated molecules, and that it gives us a pKa, right? And I'm going to talk about how we then incorporate quantum mechanical information to really accurately calculate pKa's. Okay, great. So, pKa is a very simplified way of quickly relaying to another chemist, chemist to chemist, what is the likelihood that a molecule is protonated in a given solution, right? And that value, that number, relates directly to the free energy difference between the molecule in a protonated state and that molecule in a deprotonated state, right? So this equation gives us the relationship between pKa and free energy. So if we want to calculate a free energy difference between the protonated and deprotonated states, we then need to model the protonated and deprotonated states, and then we need some math, mathematical equation to connect the two states, right? And just ignore the math for a minute, but just focus on the fact that what this function says we need to do if you guys can see me on the screen. So what you need to do is you need to simulate over um, the protonated state, then you need to simulate over the deprotonated state, and then you need some means for calculating potential energy differences between those states, and you're gonna input those into this fancy equation. So now, how do we define potential energy differences in this function? Well. Uh, in computational chemistry, we have multiple ways of calculating potential energy. And potential energy is like if you think of a lamp on the top of a shelf versus a lamp on the bottom of the shelf, we know that there's potential energy as a result of height, height difference, right, from gravity. Um, but in computational chemistry, molecules have potential energy as a result of their bond lengths, angles, rotation, and there are many different ways to calculate potential energy in computational chemistry. Um, one way we can calculate potential energy is through a molecular mechanical model and another is through a quantum mechanical model. And I'm just going to leave it at that for, for the time being, but quantum mechanics relies on calculating Schrodinger equation and all this, and molecular mechanics relies on uh, modeling atoms as balls connected by springs to other atoms and those having some uh, harmonic or Hooke's law relationship between one another. Okay, but for the particular protein systems that we're interested in in our lab, we need really accurate, or we want really accurate modeling of electrostatics, meaning we want accurate treatment of electron position because we think in these microenvironments or in these cases immediately surrounding the amino acids of interest, there could be slight changes in those electron positions. For example, PETase is an enzyme that operates near a surface where that surface has these repeating units of aromatic, aliphatic, aromatic, aliphatic. Aromatic groups can be polarized. Cer certainly the surface of a highly aromatic unit next to water can be polarized, and that water definitely doesn't act like bulk water near the surface, okay? And then there's the remaining part of the enzyme, right? So these are really nuanced or subtle cases, okay? And then um, the sister enzyme, metase, it uses the same catalytic machinery, so it uses the serine histidine aspartate catalytic triad, but the, the active site is so much different. This active site is buried or sequestered, so it's not near the surface, it's not near bulk water, it's buried inside the protein. So the electrostatics of that enzyme are going to be much different than PETES and much different than a, an a active site that's um, allowed to interact with uh, bulk solvent. So um, these cases of interest to us, we really think we want to model these with quantum mechanics. So we need some model that treats electron placement. So we need either quantum mechanics or some semi-empirical level of theory. Uh, however, pKa is related to free energy difference. Therefore, it's an ensemble property. So we always need sufficient sampling and ensemble properties. But also pKa can be perturbed by changes in conformation. So rotations of amino acids or the vice versa, conformational changes can induce pKa changes. So we still need lengthy simulations, we need to simulate over a long period of time, and we need to treat those interactions quantum mechanically. Okay, so if we go back to this question that I posed a long time ago, which is how do we calculate potential energy differences and input them into this equation, well, we're going to need, in the cases that we're interested in, quantum mechanics, and if we just naively plug quantum mechanics into this equation here, then we see that what we need is to conduct some quantum mechanical molecular dynamics simulation. 
And unfortunately, for any case of interest, this could become intractable, right? <clears throat> so uh, instead, what we can do is we can use uh, what one thing that we know about free energy, which is that it's a state function. So if we have some free energy of interest here, like this, that we can't calculate easily, right? We could step through, we could for, uh, construct an advantageous thermodynamic cycle of interest and step through another free energy difference that's actually easier to simulate, right? And you can think of this like if there is a major crash on 75 that's not allowing anyone to get through, you can take back roads, you know, I don't know, what's 301, 41, I don't know, one of those. If you're not in Florida, this doesn't make any sense to you anyway, um, and, and get to your destination via some detour, right? So that's what we're doing. We're doing a thermodynamic detour, right? <clears throat> this is great because now, if we choose our other level of theory wisely, we can do a lot of simulations and we can use any free energy estimator of interest here. And we can use all the tricks of the classical alchemical free energy trade, like lambda windows. Ask me if you have questions, please put questions in the comments section. If this stream is still even going, I don't know. Um, yeah, uh, lambda states and also softcore potentials to ensure that this free energy difference here is fully, fully converged. Now, the only question becomes, how do we connect between levels of theory? Uh, and that's when I say that that um, this, this question about how to connect between levels of theory within an indirect free energy simulation, that's formed like the central focus behind a collaboration between my PI at USF, Lee Woodcock, and Stefan Borsch at the University of Vienna. And I've really been the huge benefactor of this because as a result, I get to live and work in Tampa and then travel to uh, Vienna a couple months out of every other year or so. And I've had made four trips since 2014. And as a result of all of this work between the three of us and um, our other collaborator, Philip Bookhammer, who will be defending in two weeks, uh, we've published a lot of papers about this question, how to connect between levels of theory. And so all I'm trying to say is, we think we know what we're doing now, or have always known, but now we know better, I don't know. We think we know what we're doing and uh, I'm going to be using these four papers to construct the following arguments. I don't have time to go into all the data, but um, if you have questions, go to these four papers or ask me. Um, you could go to these two papers because those are like really well written. Um, but okay, fine. So if we go back to this uh, cycle that I talked about earlier, and we want to connect between disparate levels of theory, how do we do that? Well, unfortunately, I can't go through everything, but I'll just say that we have two methods. So we have, we can use either Zwanzig's equation, this equation down here, or Jarzinski's equation, this equation right here, okay? And in order to um, calculate free energy differences from these equations, all they simply say is, I'm gonna generalize them quickly, all they simply say is run one simulation. If you're trying to get this free energy difference from a simulation at the protonated state at your low level of theory, and then calculate potential energy differences between those two levels of theory, and then voila, you get a free energy difference. And Jarzinski's equation is the exact same, except instead of calculating potential energy differences, you have to calculate non-equilibrium work required to switch between those potential energy surfaces. Ask me, I, I could talk about this stuff all day long. Um, but now the question becomes, okay, Fiona, what do we use? You just gave us two methods and no answers. You're going to have to um, understand what potential energy surfaces you are interested in simulating between and then pick which method to use based on the amount of overlap you have between those potential energy surfaces and the reason being is as follows. So Swansea's equation has the benefit and it's inexpensive. You run one equilibrium, long equilibrium simulation and calculate potential energy differences but your two potential energy surfaces better be highly overlapping meaning if you have a potential energy well in the one surface, you better have a potential energy well nearby in the other surface. And same for maxima and whatnot, right? Um, uh, Jarzinski's equation has the distinct advantage in that it improves overlap. So in the calculation of these non-equilibrium work values that go into the equation, you can actually relax a lot of the stiff degrees, stiff and soft degrees of freedom that provide um, statistical noise in the calculation of these work values, that means that the overall work values, work distributions are much narrower and their forward and backward averages align much better, meaning they overlap better, which is great. The problem is that it's more expensive than Swansea's equation, so it requires 
um, more computing resources. So if you don't have access to something like a large uh, supercomputer or a computing cluster, this might become intractable. So you need to look at your resources and the potential energy surfaces you're interested in. Okay, now I promised I would calculate a pKa. Um, and so far I've just done a bunch of math. So let's get back to pKa's. So if we want to calculate a pKa between a protonated and deprotonated molecule, we need to model ultimately the protonation. So we need to simulate, have some means for simulating the protonated state, deprotonated state, and then calculating the solvation free energy of the proton. Okay. Now, um, this free energy difference here, this blue line, that's the one that I argue needs to be calculated really, really accurately. So I want this at a quantum mechanical DFT level of theory. <clears throat> and Zhang Shui's group in 2005 showed that you can actually do this alchemical free energy difference at a semi-empirical level of theory. Um, <clears throat> and then they, they connected up to DFT using a second order cumulative approximation. But all I argue is that you actually can do this alchemical free energy difference at a molecular mechanical level of theory, which is actually much, much easier to simulate. And then you can, can connect all the way up to DFT using a combination of Joseph's keys and Swansea's equation. And again, I'm choosing where, where and when to use JAR based on the amount of overlap between those potential energy surfaces. Okay. Uh, right, so then you get, out of this you get a DFT quality pKa ultimately from MM, molecular mechanical cheap simulations, which is fun. Super fun. So we tested this on a set of canonically titratable amino acid analogs in solution, so just small molecules in solution. And here is what we got. Um, this is what we got. So for these six molecules, four out of the six of them, uh, we predict within one pKa, uh, one pKa unit of the um, of the experimental value, which is really uh, awesome because additionally the problem with pKa is that it's a logarithmic function. So any deviation in the pKa by one or two pKa units actually indicates an order of magnitude increase in predicted proton concentration. So pKa is a really sensitive test case for computational methods because if you can get it very accurately, that's it's both sensitive and difficult to get accurately, but also it, the, the implications of inaccuracy are much more um, compounding. Okay, great. But unfortunately, like you see, for 4 methylimidazole and p I think Dr. Guida, um, the, we are off with these two molecules by two or four pKa units. And we think we know what's going on there. I just haven't had time to um, recalculate those at the improved, according to our improved workflow, which we want to it, like implement, um, but ask. Let me know if you want to. If you want to know more, I'm more than interested in talking about it again. And okay, for the final thing, overall we have an average error compared to experiment. That's this last 1.52, average error compared to experiment of 1.52, uh, meaning out of all six of these molecules, on average we are 1.52 pKa units off, and that's actually excellent considering a paper in 2011 they conducted alchemical free energy simulations at the DFT level of theory. So they did the mutations at DFT and then they um, calculated pKa's from that. And they actually got an average deviation pKa by 2.1. So we're actually closer to the experimental values, but for, by using molecular mechanical simulations. Okay, that's awesome. And then if you just look at the average over the four that we know uh, are doing really well, we have sub pKa unit average error compared to experiment. Great, so that's everything. Um, I talked about these three topics and we had some technical difficulties at the beginning, which is to be expected. Um, just in summary, CompChem is actively working to combat COVID and you can help. Um, I don't know if the, if the live stream people on Facebook saw that, but there are crowdsourced supercomputing projects you could go sign up for. There's a crowdsourced drug design project you can go sign up for. I've included links to those in both the YouTube description and the Facebook um, thingies. <clears throat> and then Erebusinone protects sponges in Antarctica by inhibiting crustacean molting. Pedase depolymerizes plastic. Double mutant pedase does it better. Uh, Megan Rapino is in shape. I am out of shape. And this was shocking information to everyone. Everyone was shocked by this. Um, and finally, we can calculate accurate absolute pKa's from indirect free energy simulations. Okay, so I tried to fit anyone and everyone I've ever known on this slide, and I don't think it worked. Um, but thank you, 
to all of my PIs, past, present, and future. If your name is underlined, that's because I used your data in my thesis or I presented some of your data today, meaning we collaborated and your name is on that paper. Um, thank you to all of my uh, Twitter mutuals that allowed me to use some of their simulations and artwork in my presentation, particularly about COVID. Um, thank you for being, thank you for being a friend to my friends. Uh, thank you to my family for putting up with me since I was born. And I have stars next to people that on here who are healthcare workers. So I think we need to take a special moment to um, thank them for putting their lives on the line to protect our population and protect our most vulnerable people. And finally, thank you to you, the viewer. Um, I think no one really expects they're gonna defend their PhD this way, but I'm very happy that I have maybe some people behind the camera, at least have Keith here, um, watching. And yeah, so with that, <laughs> I'm gonna take questions. And we're gonna have to do questions creatively, of course. So um, if you have questions, I hope that you have been uh, commenting them. So I'm going to now go to the, the Facebook stream and see if anyone has questions. Everyone posted tweets. Um, everyone posted like little, uh, little thingy majigs. Okay, so are you on the Facebook or the YouTube? So the YouTube comments are deactivated? Fabulous. Okay. That's okay. I'll figure it out. Um, if not, we can just switch to the private defense. Uh, I'm just going to the Facebook now to see if we have comments on the Facebook stream. If not, we'll just... Uh, just right here. Okay. Okay, five comments. Uh, no questions so far. My dad says I could still be Megan Rapino and keep researching. Um, that's news. Yeah, so I have no questions so far. Um, let me go to... I'm just waiting to see if there's any questions. Uh, my, oh, oh, we got a question. Okay, Steve, thank you, Steve. Okay, Steve asks, hey, Fiona, were you using explicit solvent for the PKA uh, or small, the PKA calculation of small molecules? Okay, so this is something I didn't go into, but I'll explain it here. I'm gonna go to another slide. I used in quick, I used explicit solvent, um, and I used generalized Born solvent, uh, or no, a GSBP, yeah, generalized solvent boundary potential. Um, just looking for the extra slides on PKA. Uh, thank you for being a friend. PKA extra slides. Let's see. There we go. Okay, so how I modeled, and this is slide 261. So I'm coming over here now. Thank you for being a friend. Okay, how I modeled these um, small molecules in solvent was I had a sphere of explicit water, and then I used GSBP, which models infinite bulk with a dielectric potential and a, a generalized boundary separating the explicit and the dielectric potential. And all of these were treated with TIP3 modeling. So this is TIP3 waters. Um, the solute itself, so when I'm talking about connecting between molecular mechanical and semi-empirical and quantum mechanical, the solute itself is what's being treated quantum mechanically. And now I'll just go ahead and go into, um, for those, molecules oh we do have more questions coming in great um can you tell me when 30 minutes is up okay three uh, three thirty three forty five oh nice. 30 minutes from now okay um so the right explicit waters infinite dielectric 
This little guy, at the alchemical uh, free energy difference was calculated classically, and then we connected up to semi-empirical and then ultimately DFT using QMMM. So this little fellow was treated quantum mechanically, right, with semi-empirical and then ultimately DFT, and all the surrounding waters were treated explicitly. Now, this plays into why we think those two um, particular solutes were so, um, had, had such big errors, because they are right up against explicitly treated uh, um, point charge water molecules, right? So there's a likelihood that the quantum mechanical energies are being overpolarized. Um, so we think that what we can do to fix those two, which are formethylimidazole and peak cresol, uh, and I have pictures of them here, and that these are particularly sensitive because they're aromatic groups, right? So there's, there's likelihood of a lot of delocalization of electrons, so it could be that the, that though that delocalization is being overpolarized as a result of uh, interaction directly next to explicit water molecules. So what we're going to do is we're going to rerun these calculations uh, for at least those two and also for ethyl thiol with the first solvation shell of water treated quantum mechanically as well. So this shouldn't be much more expensive, but we think it will improve the predictions. Okay. I'm gonna go check to see if there was another question. Um, <clears throat> any particular reason for, okay, thank you. Philip asks, any particular reason for omega B97 XD basis set for PKA? So, and oh, basis set choice for PKA. So for this PKA work, we actually um, used a whole bunch of functionals and basis sets. And then I, sorry guys, I benchmarked the results per functional and basis set. And then let me see if I can get to the slide. Or basically, yeah, we're coming in. Okay, yeah, so this is how I treated the molecules. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, great. And that's 274. <clears throat> so basically, omega B97XD 631 plus plus G double star was the best result out of all of the results that we got. And actually, it's really interesting. And, and actually, Philip, this was an interaction energy corrected um, treatment. So we treated the solute with omega B97XD 631 plus plus G star star. We treated the QMMM interaction at B3 lip 631 plus G star. So at a lower level, lower basis set. Um, we used in B, we were trying to mitigate some of that overpolarization, uh, but uh, particularly, omega B97 XD has shown to be really important for treatment of sulfurs um, because I just in other research saw that lip based functionals, so B lip through B3 lip and O lip, were terrible at treating sulfur based compounds. They couldn't even get the geometries right relative to like couple cluster and higher ab initio levels of theory. So, um, omega B97 XD was best for sulfur. But then the problem was that stupid ethyl thiol was actually the most sensitive test case because um, it would be, ethyl thiol's numbers were more accurate with smaller basis sets, indicating that polarization might be causing an issue. However, omega B97 XD, the ethyl thiol numbers were consistent regardless of base, basis set size, and I'm just looking to see if that's true, yeah. So then when we used omega B97 XD to treat the solute quantum mechanical internal energy and then used a lower level of theory to try to combat some of the overpolarization that resulted in a more rigorous uh, set of results, meaning they were less susceptible to changes based on what the solute itself was. Um, but with the other methods and basis sets, we had like so much variability uh, just per solute itself. Okay, I hope that answers Philip's question. Uh, Zach asks, um, how do you ensure systematic improvability in your calculations if you're using DFT? Do you not just have, do you have ideas how to improve, um, improve electronic structure? Okay. Okay. Um, right. This is a big question. So there are many different things that we did that I had to kind of skip over, but, um, in this scheme, let me see if I can get back to the scheme really quick. It's going to look slightly different. Yeah. So in this scheme, a couple of things that we did uh, was we calculated the alchemical free energy difference between the protonated and deprotonated state with a dummy atom. So we did this mutation alchemically. 
Then we corrected up to SCC because we could do this feasibly with um, Dresinski's equation, right? Where the solute was treated with SCC, the waters were treated with molecular mechanics, so that's QMMM. Then we corrected with Zwanzig's equation, so just potential energy differences between uh, the, the, the semi empirical, so SCC, DFTB, up to DFT. Now, DFT has a known ish problem for uh, proton affinities or, or being inaccurate with regards to proton affinities. So we actually also corrected the proton affinity relative to CCSD parentheses T. So for all of these molecules, I calculated the, what the proton affinity is at DFT, the proton affinity is at ab initio, and then corrected the, this DFT number with the correction based on the proton affinity of CCSD parentheses T. Okay, I think that answers the first part of your question. Um, the second part of your question is, do you have any ideas how to improve electronic structure calculations for proteins? Um, not for whole proteins, but uh, with QMMM, the benefit of QMMM, let me see if I can get to a picture that could, <clears throat> the benefit of QMMM is you can just de determine what region of your total system you want to treat very, very accurately, and what region of your total system you want to treat with, with um, less, with more of an approximate method that's faster to simulate, right? Uh, of course, the PKA, uh, or no, sorry, of course we can't treat a whole pro a protein with quantum mechanics. This would be, at this point, this would be intractable, right? This would be um, computationally ex expensive out the wazoo. But um, what we can do is we can treat a small portion of our protein quantum mechanically and then treat the surroundings of the protein uh, molecular mechanically. So if we go back to the example I had, maybe I have it still somewhere here. I say when I get nervous. I don't have a picture up. Here it is. Yeah. So we go back to these examples um, with PETES. And like I, I was harping on the fact that PETES is in a really unique microenvironment. We could treat the substrate as well as these catalytic amino acids and maybe some surrounding, if it's near a surface, some surrounding pieces of PET plastic quantum mechanically. Then we can cut those off from molecular mechanical modeling which is the, the remainder of the protein plus the remainder of the, the bulk, any waters coming in and out. You can also restrain waters that stay near, so you could treat some waters quantum mechanically. Um, and then you can treat the surface, remainder of the surface molecular mechanically. So I think this answers your question. I'm not entirely sure. Mm. Is, does it cleave other, okay. Adam asks, is PETES PET specific or does it cleave other polyesters? Is there any anal analog for, for polyethylene polyvinyl chloride? This is a good question. Um, so PETES specifically cleaves PET and PEF, and they're experimentally working on uh, PETES activity with like polybutyl succinate and some other more aliphatic um, polyesters. I don't know polyvinyl chlorides of PVC, right? Like PVC pipes and whatnot. Um, Basically, if you put PETACE in your pump, pump, plumbing system, will it destroy the PVC pipes? I, I don't know. I don't think it does. I, I don't know the structure of polyvinyl chloride, um, but what we know that's key about this interaction is the aromatic units. Uh, so if there aren't vinyl, I don't think that means that there's an aromatic unit. Um, <laughs> yeah, so... <laughs> Sorry, guys. Uh, I don't think that it would degrade polyvinyl chloride because there needs, I think it needs to be this aromatic unit. And we have results from, from uh, PBS or these other aliphatic groups where it doesn't have activity on aliphatic based, um, aliphatic based substrates. However, that's a whole backstory of this is we really want to engineer PETACE to act on different types of plastic. So, that's part of the reason we wanted to understand what's the evolution leading to PETACE, so we can understand what mutations could we make in the uh, PETACE active site that could allow us to um, degrade uh, different types of plastics. So we know for now it degrades at least semi-aromatic polyesters, which include PET and PEF. Now there's a whole nother half of the story, which is that other enzyme metase. And that other enzyme, metase, seems much, much more specific to just PET, at least from what our experimental collaborators have seen. Uh, but that work is going to be published soon, so I don't want to give too much uh, away. <clears throat> I'm just looking at the comments again to see if there's more questions. Everyone's waving to me. 
Let me see if I wave back. I waved back. Okay. Oh, Sarah asks, what was the link you were talking about with drug discovery? So uh, for Sarah, there is a um, there is a crowdsourced drug discovery project in COVID. If you're interested, it uh, it does probably require a little bit of, of chemistry knowledge. Um, but that in my on my Facebook event, if you go to it, I have a big post where I include a bunch of links. In there is a link to something called Postera, and they are accepting submissions. If you like draw a molecule or whatever, they will synthesize, or first they will computationally dock your mo molecule into one of the proteases of COVID. So they're trying to des design protease inhibitors for COVID, and you can go in and draw a molecule and they'll computationally dock them. And if anything has good results docking wise, they'll then go to experiment. Um, so you can participate in that, and that's on, if you go to my, my Facebook, and I can also send you the link later. But that's a really cool one as well. Um, just trying to see if we have more questions. Lots of people are waving at me. I think people are waving. Okay, um, Aunt Claire asks, free energy is awesome. Will you be continuing on in your next career step? If not, what will you be exploring? Um, so next, I have already accepted a postdoc at Romeo Morrow's group at UCSD. So Romeo Morrow and Andrew McCammon, Andy McCammon at UCSD. So I'll be a joint postdoc with them. So COVID permitting, I will be moving to San Diego um, in August and continuing there for at least, you know, a couple of years. Um, don't have any more questions yet. Uh, yeah, I think, I think that's it. Um, yeah, so I think that's probably it. We gave it, we gave it about 15 minutes. What do you think, Keith? Vienna, your PhD thesis seems to have the momentum of a runaway freight train. Why are you so smart and popular? Who, who said that? Me. You said that! It's, from, it's, a, it's a quote from The Simpsons. It's a quote from The Simpsons? Okay. Uh, <laughs> why am I so smart and popular? <laughs> I don't know. Do you really want me to answer that question? Yes. Okay. I have 15 minutes to answer. I have 15 minutes to answer. Do, 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 do. Okay, I think that's probably it for questions. What do we think? Mm. Okay, um, to the public people, thank you all so much. Oh, I just got a message. I'm just checking if it's a question. It's not a question. Um, thank you all so much for watching. I super appreciate you guys uh, coming to watch, and I'm sorry for the technical delay at the beginning. Um, this is a whole new world. Um, okay, so with that, I think I'll probably shut down these streams and then turn it over to the private defense with my committee. Um, okay, go team. So let me figure out how to <coughs> turn this off. Now I've got to figure out. Thanks, Lauren. Did you have a question? Okay. 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 So everyone, hi over here. Uh, Bye, Lauren. Becky sent Thank me you. some flowers. Oh, Becky sent me flowers. That's what came in the mail. Okay, now I feel bad for telling you not to open it. <laughs> I'm trying to have it ready for the end. Like, here you go. Oh, that's so sweet. Okay. Can you guys still see me? Thanks, Dr. Guido. It says, congratulations, Fiona. We are so happy for you and your accomplishments. We know you will make an impact and the science community and the world love, love the cranes. Aww. Correct. I cannot see you, Dr. Merkler. Dr. Chen. Yeah, YouTube's still alive, by the way. 